Okay, then I think we'll have uh, sound. That's excellent. And uh, I'm glad uh, to welcome you all here to uh, La Fable. Uh, good morning and welcome to Civita Breakfast, hosted in uh, cooperation with the Oslo Freedom Forum, which finally is back here in Oslo after three years due to the pandemic. Since we're streaming this event live on the internet, let me also wish our viewers online a very warm welcome and a good morning. My name is Erik Løkke. I'm a fellow here at Civita, and I will be your moderator. Civita has been a partner to the Oslo Freedom Forum from the very start back in 2009, and we take great pride in being an official partner. And every year since 2010, we have, of course, capitalized on the forum's ability to bring international speakers and present them to an even broader Norwegian public. Today's theme is not surprisingly Putin's attack on Ukraine, and more precisely, how can we fight back? How can we fight Vladimir Putin? Putin has turned Russia ever more authoritarian, effectively making the country a dictatorship. He has also supported authoritarian leaders in Belarus and Kazakhstan by cracking down on democratic movements. What Vladimir Putin fears is not so much NATO as the idea of liberal democracy. So how can the Western world help Ukraine? And how can we promote liberal and democratic values in Russia? These are the questions we are going to focus on today. And to enlighten us, it's a pleasure to welcome back Mr. Gary Kasparov, chairman of the Human Rights Foundation and former world chess champion, and a political <coughs> opponent and an ardent Putin critic for many, many years. Mr. Kar Mr. Kasparov <coughs> has visited our forum numerous times, uh, and we are proud to welcome you back, uh, Gary. And I will give you the floor in just a few seconds. Just let me end my introduction by giving some practical information. Uh, Gary Kasparov will have an opening uh, introduction for about 10 to 15 minutes, whereafter we will open up for questions and comments from the audience. We have a microphone, which uh, a colleague of mine will carry around for you to use. Please introduce yourself upon taking the floor and speak directly into the microphone. I need to emphasize, as always, that, we're not opening, that, that we are opening up for questions and comments, not additional speeches. This meeting will finish <laughs> no later than 9 o'clock. So I kindly ask you to be seated unless it's absolutely necessary to leave prior to that meeting. My final point, we urge you to share your thoughts on today's topic on social media. The hashtag is CivitaFocus, but do remember to turn your mobile on a silent, moan, silent mode. So much for the practicalities. It's a great uh, pleasure to give the floor to you, Gary, Kaspar Gary Kasparov, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, yeah, okay, happy to be back. Though when I just walked from the hotel, I wasn't sure whether I was still asleep because the name changed. <laughs> yes, that's my first time in this place because before I was in Christiania. <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, but again, name changes, but the spirit is the same. So, but the topic has changed. Actually, topic hasn't changed. Uh, but I just found out that after February 24th, people were listening to me with uh, mm, more attention and interest. <laughs> I'm no longer a warmonger. Yeah, I'm just, you know, somebody who is a realist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people kept asking me, so how, how could you predict Putin's moves? I said, I didn't have a magic uh, uh, ball, you know. I didn't have a special, you know, gift of, of being prescient. I was listening to what he said. Yeah, that's it. You know? And when I heard him still being um, um, a prime minister and Yeltsin's successor, saying there were no such a thing as former KGB agent. I knew Russian democracy, fragile democracy, was in great danger. When I heard him repeatedly saying the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe, I knew the new Russian independent neighbors could be also at great risk. And when I heard him talking about return to spheres of influence, in Munich 15 years ago at security conference, looking into the eyes of the old world leaders, I knew that he was ready to act. Spheres of influence, you all remember, this is a language from Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This is the language Hitler and Stalin used to divide uh, uh, Europe. Um, and next year, after this speech, he attacked the Republic of Georgia. Still, not much has happened. I've been writing articles about Vladimir Putin and his potential threat to the world for a very long time. My first article, warning about Putin, was dated January 4, 2001 in the Wall Street Journal. 
In 2008, in August, I wrote another article about uh, Putin's uh, next move, and I said the next attack would be Ukraine. People asked me, how did you find out? I said, you know, I looked at the map. <laughs> And it was so, so obvious. Putin believed that he had to spread the Russian influence. And as every dictator, though technically in 2008, from 2008 to 2012, he had someone else there. Do you remember the name of this person? Maybe somewhere yeah, it's a very educated audience. But most of my, you know, my audiences, they don't even recall the name. Because you don't remember the name of the shadow. I have to give him credit that you know, he found someone who, having absolute power, eventually returned back to Putin. So he's, you know, yeah, we should respect our enemies, just, just to recognize their th strengths. And uh, Putin, you know, was a good psychologist. He always, you know, tried to, he always found the best way to, 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 to work with his counterparts. And one by one, he just recognized that he could do almost whatever. Because dictators never ask why. They always ask why not. They never stop until they're stopped. Liberal ideas are great, is, is great. But then he's not afraid of liberal ideas. He's afraid of liberal ideas armed. And you know how to fight Vladimir Putin? We don't have to find answer. Ukrainians did. They're fighting back, and they're fighting that with great success. And all we have to do is to make sure that they win. Let's not talk, uh, talk about the end of the war. Let's not talk about the end, the ceasefire. The, uh, the best thing we can do is to make sure Ukraine win the war. Because if, it, if, they, if they don't, we all lose. Now, today, these days, people talk, oh, uh, Putin attacked Ukraine, so whether he made any mistake. I said, uh, dictators always make the fa fa uh, fatal mistake by underestimating the will of free people. Putin was not the last one, uh, the first one, and um, I'm afraid not the last one. Hopefully, maybe, maybe for our li lifetime, he'll be the last one. And, uh, when Vladimir Putin annexed Crimea in 2014, I was absolutely shocked by, by the fact that the free world responded, not with a yawn, but okay, bad. But what can we do? Um, even the portion of the sanctions that were imposed on Russia today could have stopped Putin from further aggression. Sanctions? Okay, they call it sanctions. Angela Merkel, Barack Obama, they call it sanctions. Mosquito bite. Putin laughed at them. And next year, you know, I, re I released my book, Winter is Coming. OK, you can guess I was a fan of the um, Game of Thrones. <laughs> but the publisher that looked at the book, no, they, okay, they didn't bother about the title. But they were very much concerned about the subtitle. The subtitle said, why Vladimir Putin and the enemies of the free world must be stopped. So, it's not, it's, it's a bit too aggressive, uh, but it's, it's already after Crimea. Um, you know, it's enemies. It sounds very much like Cold War. I said, absolutely, it's a Cold War because winter is coming. <laughs> so the book was released, um, mixed, re mixed reaction. So people looked at the book and said, oh, Gary Kasparov was very critical of Obama. That's from the left. Yeah, because, yeah, and I was critical of Obama. And by the way, I was critical about Bush 41, Bill Clinton, Bush 43, Barack Obama, of course, Donald Trump, yeah, <laughs> and, and even the first year of President Biden. So I have a pretty good record of criticizing six consecutive US presidents, three from each side. Because I didn't care who was in the White House, I cared about politics. And, um, Again, yeah, let's not go all the way back to 1991, though I think we have to recognize one fact. The reason we are where we are today is that after 1991, the free world lost its fighting spirit. You remember, what was the best-selling book in 1992? The End of History. <laughs> I have to admit, I also enjoyed it. So I remember this is the days, the great days of celebration, August 1991, when we removed Felix Dzerzhinsky's statue and just to put it somewhere else. Big mistake. We had to burn down the KGB buildings. Because the dictators, they always need symbols. It's just, it's, it's, we may not understand the, the power of symbols, but they do. And uh, you know, we, we had to do something more than just removing just one, one statue, because now it's, it's about to come back. But even without coming back, the spirit of Felix Zerzhinsky is still very much alive. And having a KGB lieutenant colonel, 
in the office. That was a clear sign. And by the way, the first thing Putin did as the president of Russia, return Soviet anthem. Different words, same music. Music, music for his ears. Um, and, um, and year after year, and again, it's a, it's, it will take 10 volumes, I don't, and maybe more, and years to describe all the crimes committed by Vladimir Putin. But it was not like you know, he jumped you know, from square one all the way to the aggression of Ukraine. It's step by step. And uh, now it's, everybody says, oh, remember Adolf Hitler, Putin, Hitler, Hitler, Putin, Hitler, Putin. I had been attacked viciously by many journalists when I suggested that Putin could be turned into another Hitler. I remember in 2013, I had an interview with Canadian TV, and it was just before the Sochi Olympics. And I suggested that Sochi Olympics could become some sort of Berlin 1936, you know, the platform for dictator to shine uh, on the world stage and then to launch an attack on the neighbor. She almost walked away, saying, how could you compare Mr. Kasparov with Putin to Hitler? Don't you understand? I said, wait a second, ma'am, please sit down. We're talking about Adolf Hitler of 1936. If you don't trust me, you can read your Canadian papers. You can read American papers. You can read French papers, British papers. What they wrote about Adolf Hitler in 1936, also in 1937, also in 1938. Now, what we must do is to make sure that Vladimir Putin, who is absolutely Hitler in 1936, will not turn Hitler in 1941. She didn't hear this message. And by the way, you know, it took 20 months for Hitler after the Berlin Olympics to annex Austria. It took 20 days for Putin to annex Crimea after the Olympics. Acceleration, 21st century, but the, the, the trend is the same. And, um, and again, recognizing that Crimea went on and then he showed up in Syria. Uh, it's a result of Obama, president of the United States, walking away from the red line. I'm not here to debate whether, you know, the imposing red line on Assad was a good idea or a bad idea. But when it's imposed, you don't ask any more questions. If you are the sheriff and you have the red line, somebody crosses it, you shoot. You don't ask questions. And I remember my debates with, with many political pundits when I said the consequences of this decision to walk away will be felt throughout the world. They laughed at me. So, carpet bombing, Aleppo and other Syrian strongholds. When people look at the horrors of the Ukrainian war and, and see the ruins of Mariupol, they say, ah. Oh. I make an experiment. I put three pictures, Grozny 2000, Aleppo 2016, and Mariupol 2022. I bet you you will not recognize which one is what. Vladimir Putin has been a war criminal from the very beginning. But only now we just recognize it. What's happened is, Okay, February 24th, so this is, I have to say that, you know, it didn't give me any, any joy, of course. I was right all the time, but, you know, what's, what's the point? And, you know, last time I was attacked for being a warmonger and for just, you know, spread, spreading panic was four days before the war, and you know where? On Ukrainian television. I was on a live TV show, just four days before the war, and I talked about imminent war. And a Ukrainian prominent political commentator viciously attacked me, saying, what the hell are you talking about, Mr. Kasparov? It's because of you. Our economy is paralyzed. We live in fear. So it's all about, you know, it's a smoke. I said, look, I had enough glory in my life. I don't mind being wrong. Actually, I'll be very happy if I'm wrong. I can swallow my pride. But just imagine for a second if I'm right. And you look at the map. Your country is surrounded from north, east, and south. Vladimir Putin brought 200,000 troops that are standing, you know, uh, ready at your borders. He even brought part of his Pacific fleet to the Black Sea. That's a long way, last time I checked on the map. So do you think he did it for bargaining? And for eight years after Crimea, when he didn't want to hide his intentions, Russian propaganda for, in 24-7, kept telling Russian citizens that Ukraine was not a real state. That so re, the taking part of Ukraine or whole Ukraine was, you know, was Russian's imperial duty. Um, there is a paradox in history that dictators always lie about what they have done. But so often they're telling us exactly what they're going to do. 
And it's the, the, tragi the, the tragedy is that, you know, Vladimir Putin was very open with his plans and ideas. Again, we cannot blame him for being secretive. And uh, if in 1925, when Mein Kampf was published, people could shrug their shoulders saying, okay, who was Adolf Hitler? He was, no, he was just literally nobody at the time. But Vladimir Putin talked about these things being in the office, already being, you know, in, in, just being in charge of one of the world's superpowers with nuclear weapons. And again, we all been waiting uh, for, you know, for this tragic day. And then the war started. Um, so again, was Putin wrong? No, I don't think he was wrong because every decision that people make, and, uh, and let's, not, let's not debate, by the way, is Putin sick? Is Putin mentally you know, disturbed? I don't care. For a simple reason, I'm a professional analyst. I used to be a chess player. Uh, <laughs> and I don't deal with rumors. I don't want to deal with speculations. I deal with facts. He looks sick, but I don't know. I'm not a doctor. And I think that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, um, it's a distortion. It takes us away from analyzing the picture. So we don't have to think whether he's going to die tomorrow or not. I don't know. It's the, it's, let's, you know, understand so the rationale behind his, his moves. And there is a rationale. After so many years of appeasement and collaboration, doing business with Putin, after so many years of successes of buying former leaders of many countries. Okay, Gerhard Schroeder is not on top, but there are many others. Again, the list will be so long, it will take too much time to, to mention all, all of them. He didn't expect much of a response. Oh, he said he was wrong, expecting that Kiev would fall in four days. Yes, he was wrong, so the CIA and so Pentagon. CIA expected Kiev to fall in, in 96 hours. Pentagon, General, General Milley, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, on February 2nd, February 3rd, testified on the Hill in US Congress. He argued against, against giving Ukraine any weapons. Why? The Ukrainian army would collapse soon, and these weapons would end up in the hands of Russians. The best we can do, that's not me, it's General Milley, following, by the way, a report from Grand Corporation, one of the leading corporations giving advice to US government on military affairs. Uh, the best we can do is give them some javelins, stingers, and let's hope they will have the guerrilla war. Remember the, the uh, historical parallels that have been used before the war? Afghanistan, Vietnam. Now look at the map. No jungles in Ukraine, no mountains. What the hell are we talking about? Okay, there are some mountains in, in, in the west, but the, 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 the war zone, the plains. And, uh, and Putin's calculation was nearly perfect. And uh, you know, let us you know, just think for a moment, uh, just a horrible, horrible uh, picture. Vladimir Putin succeeds. In three or four days, he's in Kyiv. By the way, Russian troops, they even carried their parade uniforms. They expected the parade in Khrushchev. And uh, I bet you now we would be seeing the same political leaders negotiating with Putin how to save pieces of Ukraine. It's, we live in a strange time where so many politicians turn to be clowns and a comedian has become a hero. I bet you that in history books, the phrase that Zelensky, the response of Zelensky on the Second Day of War to kind American offer to escape, I don't need a right, I need an ammunition, would stay as, you know, as, as prominent as what Winston Churchill said in 1940. That was the turning point of the war. And you know, it's, we, we live at a time where you know, all bets are off. You know, it's, we talk about the war, now it's already three months, and it seems like, you know, like years, because in war, every day counts for, I don't know, for 10 days maybe. For Ukrainians, it's probably eternity. And, uh, and it's, we, while discussing it, we just, you know, we probably have to make it a mental experiment. Just go back and think that I'm here on this stage. I was here five years ago. And just instead of talking about artificial intelligence uh, four years ago, in 2018, yes, um, I would tell you, you know what, I have a, a narrative for my new book. And this is a book about war in Europe. 
And you know what? Russia will attack Ukraine. And Ukrainian Jewish president will ask Germans to help. And Germany will send tanks to Kharkiv to fight Russians. I think that will be the end of my presentation. You all walk away, think, okay, maybe I have to see a doctor. This is the, this is the world we live in now. We live, we live in a world where the most vocal voice in Germany to send tanks to Ukraine is Green Party. And we live in a world where German voters triple the amount of votes for Green Party in, in the latest election in Saarland from 6 to 18 percent based on, just on that, on that fact. And social democrats lost dramatically because they, they are delaying it. It's a different world. And we saw the solidarity in Europe by people voting on Eurovision. Re record vote for Ukraine. This is the best indicator for politicians. Why Ukraine is being supported by, by the free world? With some exceptions, we'll talk about it. Uh, because we live in a democracy. And uh, the politicians, they could hear it. And uh, it's again, who could have imagined that now for, to boost your credential as a Western political leader, you have to go to Kiev. It's like pilgrimage to Rome. <laughs> Boris Johnson was the first one to recognize it, and now he's safe. You know, he was very shaky. Enough to visit to Kiev? He's a hero. <laughs> you know, it's, this is my wife joked that, you know, because well, Britain was the first one to actually to, to show support. He said, probably, you know, the ghost of Winston Churchill visited him saying, Boris, you must go to Kiev. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He did. So, and it's the... So, um, now just, it's enough just to end my, 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 my uh, uh, remarks on a positive note. Uh, in the beginning of the war, it was first phase, let's pray Ukraine could survive, you know, just, you know, a few more days. Next stage, oh, maybe they can actually survive. Then, oh, maybe they can make a compromise. And now we're all talking about can they win? The answer is yes, they can and they must. Because it's, uh, it's not only their war. Ukraine now is on the front line of the war between freedom and tyranny. And the result of this war in Ukraine will define world history, not for years, for decades. Because if Ukraine had lost, we would see a different now world with China preparing invasion of Taiwan and probably Marie Le Pen being president of France. It's, it's, the world is interconnect, interconnected now. Everything, you know, just, you know, just it's, uh, has influence. And the Ukrainian war will influence the entire world. You just mentioned Belarus and Kazakhstan. Oh, the moment Russian army is destroyed in, in Ukraine and Ukrainian flag is raised in Sevastopol, watch Venezuela, watch Syria. Let's not forget, Vladimir Putin is the leader of Dictators International. Okay, Xi Jinping is a banker. But Vladimir Putin is a spiritual leader. And uh, that's why I say that, you know, Ukrainian victory, decisive victory, is all we need uh, now to continue so our fight, successful fight, for democracy. And the liberation of Crimea and the Ukrainian flag in Sevastopol, it's the first step for liberation of my country, Russia, from Putin's fascism. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Gary. It's great to have you back. And yeah, I just, I just, uh, I extended my time limit, but sorry, I just. Yeah. That's quite I got okay. That's yet, quite okay. We'll, I got that, emotional. That's quite understandably. Uh, we'll we'll open up for questions and comments uh, very soon, so you can just uh, uh, give me a sign if you want to come on the speakers list, and I'll put you on accordingly. <clears throat> but a question from from me at first, Gary. Uh, you've been here before talking about uh, uh, the state of Russia. Uh, ten years ago, we had Boris Nemtsov here, who was brutally shot. We had also Vladimir Karamorza, many of the opposition in Russia. Who is in jail now? Who is in jail in, in Moscow. How is the state of, uh, of, of opposition in Russia, if ever? And is there any way to promote the, the Democrats who still are in Russia? Oh, some of them are in Russia, in jail. Mm. Yeah, you just answered the question. People who marched with me peacefully on the streets of Russia, they are either in exile, like myself, in jail, like Navalny or Karamurza, or killed like Boris Nemtsov. We're talking about 
making the same parallels with Nazi Germany of 1941, 1942. Maybe, hopefully it's 44 already, but I don't know, so this is. Uh, so it's no opposition. It's a fascist dictatorship. Even New York Times recognized this fact. Timothy Schneider had a good article a few days ago saying, let's, let's call things what they are. So how can you expect any opposition? Uh, we had some sort of, you know, uh, mm, uh, dissent voices that were allowed to speak until February 24th. Now, all of these people, they've gone. So we have hundreds of thousands of Russians now just uh, fleeing because that's, that's the end of the, of the hybrid time. Uh, if you say war in Russia, you can go to jail because it's a special military operation. You know, that's the Russians now, we, we always make jokes. Say so now we have to change our, you know, our history and, and uh, uh, textbooks and, and our literature. You can no longer say, you know, just about, it's about historic events. You, you, you should say the uh, uh, great patriotic special military operation 1941, 1945. <laughs> and in literature, you should say special military operation and uh, peace, Leo, Tolst Leo Tolstoy. Right, I have noticed uh, one uh, person coming on the speaker's list here. There's also a room for uh, anyone else. I also noticed the person over there. Please present yourself and speak into the microphone. Please. Oh, I'm Christian. I'm a member of a uh, democratic movement in Norway. The microphone Ru closer to your mouth. I'm a member of a uh, Russian democratic movement in Norway, Smorodina. Mm -hmm. And I had a question. You were talking about the interconnected wor world. And I've been uh, also... Uh, thinking about this topic, like the Donald Trump, Corona, and now war in Ukraine. Now, some research uh, suggests that they are nearing a tipping point, whether our civilization will make it or not. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, look, I'm not a military expert, so I just, you know, I always have to, 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 to uh, uh, mm, uh, get an indemnity for, for any, 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 any forecast. But, you know, I, I can analyze information and uh, uh, you don't have to be, you know, a great expert to recognize the fact, though many experts were wrong, as we know, that uh, Russia lost already uh, two, two battles in the north. They lost battle for Kyiv, they lost battle for Kharkiv. So we all now don't know the map. So the, currently what they're trying to, to, to do is it's, it's not even to make an advance because they promised the big, adva big, big advance on the east. It's, they made some, you know, uh, they had some successes, but relatively small. So they failed to actually surround Ukrainian, uh, uh, the bulk of Ukrainian forces in the East. But now Putin's plan is different. And, and it's, it's not, the, not only militarily, but also diplomatic. They understand they can no longer push. And it would take a month, maybe or two, before all the weapons that are being sent to Ukraine will make it to the front line. And Ukrainian army, by the way, keeps growing. Russia has no more advantage in, in manpower. Firepower, Ukraine will have overwhelming advantage. Within the next couple of months, Ukrainian army probably will be the strongest in Europe. Um, it's military, you know, they have great spirit, they have experience, and they will have weapons. Of course, advancing and just attacking, offense is a different story. The Ukrainians proved to be you know, um, great experts in operating with small units and just doing the defensive operations and, and inflicting huge damage on, 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 on the Russian troops. But, Attack is a different story. So it seems to me Russia now is they're digging in. When you look at the, at, at the map, so they want to consolidate their gains. They want to annex more territories. Again, that's not, I'm suggesting, I'm just listening to what I've been saying. And of course they mobilized uh, uh, their sympathizers and agents around the world. Now you have BBC, President Macron, New York Times calling for ceasefire. What has been ceasefire? It's the end of the war and giving Putin chance to lick his wounds and annex more territories. I'm not here just to tell Ukrainians what to do, but I suggest that nobody, do, nobody does. It's their country, and if they want to fight to the end, and I think they are, they, 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 they really want, let them, let them finish the job. So uh, I think they, they, they're capable, and, uh, and I think that's, that's, uh, that might happen uh, this summer. And, uh, and the moment they'll start the advance, I think you, it's the Putin regime might, might crumble because we also see the, the grow, it's the uh, increasing effect of sanctions. It's a, it's a slow process. People say, oh, sanctions will, will, will not topple Putin regime. Sanctions alone may not, but a combination of military defeat, 
bad news coming from, from, from Ukraine. And defeat doesn't mean, you know, just total destruction. Defeat could be psychological, because as I already talked about uh, dictators and symbolism, Crimea is the, is the core of Putin myth. Without Crimea, no Putin. And the moment first Ukrainian missiles will land in Sevastopol, you will see the shock across Russia. Because as of now, most of Russian, Russian citizens, big cities, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, they don't feel the heat of the war. When you look at the Russian soldiers there, they are being recruited from far away, so from suburbs, from national republics. That's why I knew that Putin would not call for mass mobilization on May 9th. Everybody expected, oh, we will. no, he would not. Arming people in Moscow and, and St. Petersburg, it's a bad idea. And also, you know, he, it's, he, did, he didn't want, and he doesn't want to call it war, because it's still, it's still on television somewhere else. And the moment people in Russia re will recognize that the war is about being lost, and the sanctions will start eating whatever left of their savings. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very explosive combination. So that's why, again, if nobody stands on the way of Ukraine, if all these uh, uh, appeasers' voices will not prevail, and I believe they will not this time, so we, we can expect dramatic changes, first on the front line in Ukraine, and then maybe even in Russia. Uh, bef <clears throat> before I give Arnfin the floor, I will just repeat the speaker's list. Uh, after Arnfin, I noticed uh, the person sitting here. I also noticed Nils August. Uh, I noticed Ståle and the uh, man sitting just beside. I don't know everybody's name here, so uh, excuse me for that. Uh, but I have uh, five more on the speaker's list. And being mindful of your time, we're going to end before 9 o'clock, so be sure that you register if you want to come to the speaker's list sooner rather than later. Arnfin, please. Arnfin, please. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate your voice and your great support for Ukraine and freedom. And uh, my question is, do you think we, the West, are we ready to give Ukraine whatever is needed to make sure they will win? Are we in it for the long run if this war will continue? Will we give long-range weapons? What do you think about like F-16s and more like... Uh, uh, and what do you think in the end about Crimea? Will, will Ukraine <laughs> stop before Crimea or, or will... Uh, and what will that? Uh, what will happen if they bomb Sevastopol? Will it be? Uh, how will Russia's response be? <laughs> um, should we let Ukrainians worry about Russian response? I think they're already living through hell, and it's just, let's not, you know, frighten them with escalation. They have been paying in blood for our unwillingness to recognize Putin's threat, and. Uh, if they want to make further sacrifices to recover Crimea, our moral duty, our political duty, to help them. Make sure they have all the weapons they need for that. Um, I've been advocating for no-fly zone from day one. We didn't do that. So again, how many Ukrainians died? Uh, oh, we keep talking about the cost of the war. Uh, uh, gas, oil, um, so it's so painful for Europeans. Let's, you know, let's not compare the pain of, of, from the wallet, from the pain that's being inflicted of Ukrainians. We're talking about tens of thousands of civilians being killed. But something else, you know, this is another, it's, it's, it's mentioned, but it's not a big, you know, it's not a big, not a, not a frontline story. There are more than one million Ukrainians deported. 130,000 or so kids. Deportation. The only difference with 1942, is the direction of the trains. They went westward in 1942, and they go eastward these days. Many Ukrainians ended up in Far East already. So this is, it's, we're witnessing war crimes on an industrial scale. Now, you want, you want to hear what, what we should do? Simple. We have to set up conditions for the end of the war. And let's not repeat this nonsense following President Macron and others. Every war ends up with diplomacy. Not every war. Last time I checked, World War II ended with unconditional surrender. So what we have to say? We have sanctions imposed on Russia. These sanctions will not be lifted until the Ukrainian territory is fully liberated, including Crimea and Sevastopol, by the way. This is, sometimes you have to make this distinction because that's the, they're separate, you know, even by all Russian-Ukrainian uh, agreements. Um, sanctions will not be lifted, condition two, until reparations are being paid. And we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars because half of their country has been demolished. Three, sanctions will not be lifted 
until war criminals brought to justice. Because first time in our, in, in, in our history, we are watching genocide online. Oh, we knew about Auschwitz afterwards. We didn't see the, the images. Only after the, the, the Auschwitz and, and, and Dachau and Majdanek were liberated. Yeah, we heard probably some rumors about Cambodia. Never seen the pictures. Yeah, we saw some images from Rwanda in 1994. Still didn't understand the scope of the, of the tragedy. Some from Bosnia war, some even images. But we never seen it online. So if we don't prosecute war criminals, that's bad news. Because again, the outcome of the war will, will define how the world looks afterwards for, for, for years to come. And if these three conditions are being imposed, and if the free world keeps united front, let us do in Russia the rest of the job. So I think that will be a deadly blow to Putin's regime. Don't talk about regime change. Just follow these conditions, and we'll do the regime change. Um, and uh, um, as for weapons, look, they receive enough weapons. Of course, I wish that Norwegians would give them your one of the most sophisticated missiles, anti-ship missiles, in the beginning of the war. As far as I know, the Norwegian government didn't want to be the first one to sell. So maybe they could have destroy some of the Russian ships before they inflicted huge, huge damage. Because, by the way, most of the damage to, to infrastructure and civilians caused by the warships, not the planes. Planes are just bad, but the biggest missiles they fired from the warships. So and that that's, was one of the problems from day, from day one. But Ukraine, even with their old, you know, old-fashioned uh, um, missiles, okay, maybe with, the, with a little bit of help from other countries. So uh, they sank Moscow. So that, was, that shows that, again, it's not just um, bravery of free people, but also cre creativity. Please. Uh, hello, my name is Torgai. I, um, I want to ask a question about nuclear weapons. Also because I think that's one of the worries of the politicians you talk about. Myself, I'm worried about the separate tactical and strategical nuclear weapons. Uh, and you hear Russia is, uh, is threatening about it. What are your thoughts about the reality of those threats? Highly unlikely. Uh, by the way, they are no longer threatening. If you, could, if you follow Russian propaganda, in the last couple of weeks, they forgot about nuclear weapons somehow. Mysterious. The reason is they recognize that it will not uh, uh, be one-way street. Um, let's forget about st strategic. I mean, that's, that's another story. Tactical, I agree. That's, th that was a real issue in the beginning of the war. But using tactical nuclear weapons, you have to be sure that, you know, um, you will attack an enemy, an opponent, on the battlefield that, could not, that does not have capability of fighting back. By the way, just you know, to understand why this question is relevant, you know when Russia included... Uh, use of nuclear weapons in the regional conflicts. What year was that in Russian military doctrine? Anybody knows? Ah, that was a year of great liberalization in Russia in 2009. When Mr. Medvedev talked about freedom, Patrushev, General Patrushev, included this in the military doctrine. So Russia in 2009. Oh, surprise, surprise. So that's why the question is absolutely relevant. But it was, in my view, it was more about bluffing. When Putin, people ask me about whether Mr. Putin is a great chess player, I said, no. No dictator plays chess, because chess is a game with 100% open information. Dictators always play poker. <laughs> because in poker, you can bluff. You don't have to be a winning hand. You need to bluff. You have to be a good psych psychologist. You have to look in the eyes of your opponent, and you can raise the stakes. He did all the time. Nuclear weapon was one of the elements of his bluff. And I think at the beginning, they tried to use this. Because that was, again, following Russian propaganda. We may be not as good as NATO, but we have political will. We are not going to die. Uh, um, we are not afraid to die. So they are. So the Putin's famous phrase, they will die and we will go to heaven. So immediately, you know, this is in Russia, where the recent joke saying, oh, they haven't heard it, and immediately applied to join NATO. Uh, and uh, um, um, uh, as of now, the situation has changed because they recognize that it may not be without uh, adequate response. And I always said, 
arguing, for instance, for no-fly zone. When people said, oh, it's so dangerous, it's aerial combat, uh, it's the, and then it's World War III, it's, uh, I'm not so sure. Yeah, the Russian pilots, they were quite good and dropping bombs on civilians. Meeting NATO pilots in the skies, not so sure. I don't think they trained kamikaze. Now, nuclear weapon, tactical nuclear weapon, it's not just Putin, Putin pushes the button. It goes in a chain of command. And it will end up in a, in a base with a general, missile base, or more likely warship. If Admiral, who has to make the final decision and push the button, thinks that he will be facing Hague International Crime Criminal Court in five years, he will do it. If he thinks there's a 50-50 chance that the NATO missile will come in five minutes, no. So that's why I think they just recognize that it's, they better shut up because we don't know, because it's, it's a poker, it's a gamble. But they no longer feel safe. And as, lo as long as they don't believe they can be safe, I don't think Putin will find kamikaze among his senior officers. Nils, I guess. Thank you for a very interesting speech. My name is Nils Gustav Dresden from Norwegian newspaper Minerva. Uh, I have this feeling that this conflict is deciding not just the future of Ukraine and Russia, but also, in a sense, the past of Ukraine and, and Russia. And this is one of the things that Putin fears, that if Ukraine wins, uh, then Russian history is sort of changed. It's not, no longer imperial Russia. It's sort of reduced to Moscow, and they have to rewrite their under, own understanding. But this is very, very painful and difficult, and I'm not sure... I'm wondering, how do you view Russian future if the Putin regime falls? What comes in its place? And are we certain that it's something better or could it be something even more terrible in a sense? Don't tell Ukraine it could be more terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it is, this, this is, again, that's the, that's the fear of the Ephesians. I don't, I don't want to blame you, but it's, it could be worse. No, it cannot be worse than Putin. Now, you, excellent question because it's about history. You're right. It's a, and it's a long history. It's not just, you know, last 100 years. We're not talking about Putin being a product of 105 years of the criminal com communist regime and KGB. It's, you're talking about centuries of Russian imperial expansion. And you can go even deep, deep, deep down. And some people say what we're seeing now in Ukraine is a final battle of two Russians. The Kiev's Rus, the, the, the pro-Western Russia, European Russia versus Golden Horde. And this time, the, Rus, r r the, the true r Rus is, 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 is winning. Um, it, don't forget, Russia had some European traditions. You had republics in the north e northwest, like Novgorod and Pskov, that have been trading with Ganza and just, you know, be part of the European trade routes. Uh, they have been crushed by Moscow. So this, it's the, the Asian tradition, the Golden Horde tradition, that has been inherited by the prince in Moscow eventually won. And it led to this, you know, to the history of empire that, you know, kept, you know, increasing century after century. I'm also Russian, so that's, and I believe it's time to end this. So I believe the only way for Russia to find its, its place in 21st century is to eradicate imperial virus or just, you know, following this more um, scientific language. So to, to eliminate uh, uh, imperial code, uh, imperial uh, matrix. From it, from the, from the um, its statehood code, um, is it doable? I don't know. I'm just the, but uh, it's it's the only chance. Uh, whether Russia will remain in these borders, I think unlikely. You may have Chechnya and Dagestan and Tatarstan going on their way. Fine. I think this the, the, our hope is to have Russia as the confederation of the regions that would like to get together and leave by ag and agreeing to live by the same rules. Russia should become part of European U Eurasian Eurasian space, but with European European values. Again, I don't know if it's doable, but that's the only chance. And uh, Ukrainian victory is 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 a crucial uh, element of of this plan because to bring bulk of Russian population into reality, you need military defeat. It's historically is the only thing that forces people to look into reality. And uh, while nobody's arguing for, you know, Moscow being bombed or Russia being invaded, but we need, you know, this Crimea to become this, this symbol of the end of the imperial dreams. Um, I am, I, I'm an incorrigible optimist by nature, and also it's not just about Russia, you pointed out correctly, it's about the, the balance in the world. 
Because the, the battle between democracy and freedom on one side and tyranny and, and dictatorship on the other side doesn't end with Ukrainian victory. We still have China. We still have so many things in the world that are happening, like Uyghur genocide now, or other places in, in the world where democracy has been crushed by dictators. And the fact is that Russia could move one way or another, hopefully to the side of, of, of freedom, could be a, a decisive element in, 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 in our victory because the battle for ideas will continue. It's the, again, whether we like it or not, you know, the, this war goes on. Because the evil doesn't die. It could be buried under, rub, under the rubble of Berlin Wall for a while. But the moment we lose our vigilance, the moment we turn complacent, it comes back through the cracks um, in, 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 in our, uh, um, uh, our uh, resistance. Before I give the floor to Ståle, just let me repeat the, the speaker's list. The Ståle and the lady sitting next to Ståle, and I also noticed the gentleman there. The, I hope I haven't ignored anyone, but those are the questions we have time for before 9 o'clock. Please, uh, Ståle. Okay, uh, my name is Ståle Hagen, and um, <clears throat> thank you for a very insightful and uh, interesting uh, lecture, Mr. Kasparov. Uh, it's a little bit the same as that you sp uh, spoke about. No, what do you think will happen with, with Mr. Putin if we find, hopefully find a solution, which is not a clear win or a clear a defeat, uh, somewhere, somewhere a compromise? Do you think the West will allow him to, to continue with business as usual? Uh, or do you think it in any way will uh, be possible to prosecute him with the war crimes uh, that we can see now? Um. <clears throat> yeah, if, if I use chess metaphors or chess parallels, I can say that what we're facing now, it's, um, it's a black and white game because it's good versus evil. But it's still not chess because this is not a game where you can end up with a tie. No draws, no compromises. It's either we win or he wins. And any other result but Ukrainian decisive victory and full liberation of Ukraine is our loss. Now, as for the free world, I don't know because we saw so many weaknesses and, in, and, and the lack of resolve. But as of now, I see the coalition strong enough. We have Brits and Americans, uh, we have Germans jo joining so the coalition, slowly but steadily, as they always do. You have Eastern Europeans, with ex exceptional Hungary. Uh, so it's pretty strong, you know, uh, strong um, coalition. And I don't think uh, President Macron can be as successful as, as President Sarkozy, who sacrificed part of uh, Georgian territory in 2008 to buy so-called peace. Um, um, and uh, I don't care what happens with Vladimir Putin as long as Ukraine wins and the free world keeps the coalition and the sanctions in place. For a simple reason, uh, let people around him worry about their future because when dictator is weak, he becomes a liability. And how they deal with that, it's their business. But they always look for a scapegoat and typically as a dictator. One thing I can tell you, Vladimir Putin will ever see the tribunal, which he deserves, for a simple reason, he will not live that long. Dictators do not survive these kind of military defeats. So again, I want to look at the facts and, and, and the battleground where I can help. How they will deal with Putin, who cares? They, he will not be around if Ukraine wins the war. So that's, that's as, as simple. And uh, uh, our goal now is just, you know, what we, we, it's our duty is to make sure this, the, the, the coalition of the free world stays intact and will not be lured by, by the voices of appeasers. Uh, because Russia is, it's, it's, I mean, I couldn't even imagine such an isolation because all Putin's hopes that he would have allies like China or other dictators like Kazakhstan, you see, they all sitting on the fence. Yeah, look at the other side. So, because while these guys, they don't care that Putin was, war, was an war criminal. But 
They can do business with a war criminal, but they don't want to do business with a losing war criminal. And, the, and I also yes. ignored the, the lady behind, so I also registered you, sure. But first, the lady sitting there. And good morning, my name is Milada Asmusto and I'm a professor at Oslo Metropolitan. Thank you for an excellent speech. Um, I'm originally Czech, so I grew up under Soviet occupation on my country. I'm kind of used to that the Russians like to rewrite history. Um, I'm curious, you said that in Putin's dream he would like to have Soviet back. Do you think he wants to have East Europe? As I said, Dictators do not stop until they stopped. So um, it's one step at a time. I think now it's, it's, we, can, we, can, we can be relaxed about any threats to Poland or Moldova or Romania uh, for a simple reason. He's, he's stuck in Ukraine. But God forbid he had succeeded in Ukraine. Of course, he would look elsewhere. I think the Baltic state would be the first target. And it, it, it's the being victorious in Ukraine, I don't think he would even need to cross the border. He would put all the pressure uh, on, the, on these countries, forcing political changes inside. Because it's, it's about, again, balance of power. And uh, Putin always wanted to destroy NATO, if not you know, uh, on paper, but spiritually. And now we could see the opposite effect. NATO is getting stronger. And is and more united. Again, you still have Turkey there, you have Hungary, you have France, but NATO is getting stronger and your your neighbors, Canadian neighbors now are joining. So this is who could bet on Finland or Sweden joining NATO six months ago? Yeah, I think you see I, I could win any bet here, you know, probably one to a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> now it's 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 a fact. So um, yes, he he dreamt about spreading influence. Of influence. Now it's, of course, out of question. Now he's trying to, to consolidate his gains in Ukraine. But if he survives this crisis, he would never stop. Again, because he said it. So it's his plan. That's why we have to make sure that Ukraine is fully liberated to eliminate, at least for the time being, and hopefully forever, the Russian threat, the threat of Russian imperialism to, to, to neighbors in the West. Uh, next person, please. Marit Mjølsnese, journalist in the Christian newspaper Vårt Land. Uh, we have seen a development where the Russian or the former Soviet government has gone from discouraging uh, religion altogether to, under Putin, tying tight bonds to the Russian Orthodox uh, Church. And uh, Patriarch Kirill has uh, been clear in his support of Putin. I was just wondering how you see the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in Putin's plans for Russia. Russian Orthodox Church is another department of KGB. <laughs> the only question I, 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 I ask is what, what is Petras Kirill rank? Maybe we'll know after the collapse of the regime. Since Stalin restored it, it was always under full control, and under Putin is this indistinguishable. So I don't think that we should worry at all about, about uh, Petras Kirill, because again, it's, 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 it's not being taken seriously by truly religious people. And by the way, we see the, the restoration of religious values in Ukraine. So many of the things that you know, are so dear to the Russian culture will be restored in Ukraine. Don't forget that most of the, or many Ukrainians who are fighting in the East, they're Russian speakers or even ethnic Russians. So somehow it's, 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 it's okay, Ukrainians may not like it, but it's, it's, it's a civil war. So there, again, between two Russians, European and others, you can look at the videos that when Ukrainians recording, more than half of these videos are recorded in Russian. So they talk about, you know, just is bringing down Russian planes or, 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 or shooting Russian tanks. So it's, uh, it's Ukraine that can offer us hope for, for, for restoring values, including religious values. And that's why Ukrainian church is separate, thanks God. It's a true church that is separate from the state and, and, and it's, it's trying to perform its religious duties while Kirill is simply following the orders. Final question from the audience. Uh, Mr. Kosparov, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jorn Aida. I've spent 25 years in the energy sector in Russia, Ukraine, neighboring countries, Azerbaijan also. Uh, question simple. What can we have after Putin? Uh, you touched upon a lot of the aspects, but uh, you touched upon the opposition. You touched upon the frailness of the regime once the cracks come. Um, you touched upon exiles yourself. 
foreign agent, as I understand, honorary yes. title. Enemy of the state. Enemy of the state. What could we realistically have after Putin now that we understand Patrushev is more or less holding the suitcase? Uh, that's a rumor, not a fact, but we understand he has a strong position. So what do you think is next in the Kremlin? Excellent final question. Yeah. When I hear simple question, I'm almost terrified. <laughs> uh, simple questions are the most difficult to answer, and that's... That's the $64,000 question, because it's about the future, not only of Russia, but uh, the rest of the world. Um, again, it depends very much on the willingness, readiness, resolve of the free world to end Russian empire. Let us, let us make this war the last war of Russian empire, and it can be done. Patrushev, Darishkin, you know all these names, they cannot survive if sanctions stay. As long as sanctions stay, Russia is not function, it cannot function. Even oil and gas industry, it depends on the spare parts. They cannot even produce more uh, uh, precision guided missiles because they have no spare parts. Russian economy may survive, I don't know, for maybe another six months. But it's just, it's, it, will not, it will not go just, you know, um, uh, um, mm, um, on without, you know, um, without being reintegrated in the free world. The Soviet Union had an economy that was separate, that's, that's, that, that was autonomous. Also, it had the called Eastern Bloc. It, it had other countries. It was a system, global system. I'm not here to tell you that it was effective, but it, 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 it was functioning. Russia today, it's just, it's, it's like amputated economy. And uh, if sanctions stay, and if the free world shows determination to demilitarize Russia, to make sure it's no longer a threat. I think we can see great, great changes. And yeah, you're talking about exiles, exiles like myself. There are many of us. And, uh, and it's not only us now. It's, the, it's about hundreds of thousands of Russians, capable Russians, from IT business, you know, the other Russians who were you know, partially successful in Putin's Russia, who run away. And uh, many of them just uh, cannot, cannot, can no longer be associated with Putin's Russia. And uh, I have some optimism that if, you know, if the war ends, as we all expect, for use Ukrainian victory and liberation of the, of, of, of the whole country, Crimea included, and Sevastopol. So uh, we may see changes in Russia that could you know, pass the, uh, the baton from Putin to Petrushev. And just, it's, it, will go, oh, it will stay where, you know, um, where it finds solid ground. And solid ground will be Russian, new Russian, government, transition government, that will guarantee the sanctions are lifted. Whoever can do it will have a chance. And it's not entirely in the hands of Russians. It's about the free world. And that's why I look at Americans, I look at Europeans, and I want to see the political resolve to actually turn Russia into a potential ally. I think we're all sick and tired of Russia being you know, a permanent source of a problem. Hopefully, it will become part of a solution. And I will do whatever I can to make sure this transition will be successful. Before we give uh, Mr. Kasparov uh, a warm applaud, just let me end by saying that I recommend everybody to follow the Oslo Freedom Forum online, oslofreedomforum.com. You can also check Civita on civita.no for f uh, further uh, events uh, coming uh, on the <coughs> after the summer and before the summer. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kasparov. I hope to visit you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.